Um, so I'm Shiku Venancio, or do you want to go first and introduce them? Yeah, I'm happy to introduce. So we have Shiko here, and he's anything on introduction to cause for Python beginners. And he'll also be taking questions in the end. So you can drop them in the YouTube chat and start to prefix it with, you know, questions or two speakers so you can track your questions. So let's get started. Cool. Um, I'm Chico Venancio. I'm a volunteer from Brazil. I've been editing Wikipedia for the last 15 years. Um, somewhere along 2017, I started uh, maintaining FOSS. And uh, I'm here to talk about how can it be used for beginners and hopefully for advanced use cases as well, if those are interesting to you. And I'm also generally available for the hackathon if anyone wants to go into a more specific question. I can take it right now or I can take it later in private if you want, either in work adventure or Telegram or IRC, I'm whatever, I think most channels. So get into POMS. Um, why was it created? Um, UV was one of the main uh, drivers for this. And, and POMS is a very oriented to um, ease the way that Wikipedians and Wikimedians can use more advanced tools, can use bots and scripts to do their edits and, and get things to work. We have other alternatives uh, like ToForge and Cloud VPS for that. Before we, ha we had Wikimedia Cloud Services, we had two server. And you can always do the same things that you do on pause on other cloud providers or other notebook providers. Notebook providers, we have Colab, we have MyBinder.org, um, and you can always just spin something up in AWS or Azure or, or GCT or wherever you want. But that does take effort. That does mean you need to understand how these things work. You need to get used to that environment. And usually that means using the command line in a at least medium way. It, it's not easy for everyone. And for pause, it's just there. You already have authentication with Wikimedia Wikis. Uh, you can just start coding right away. If you don't know how to code, you can even just copy something that someone else wrote and just change it to be for your wiki, just translate the strings. So it's a lot easier. You're trying, we're trying to reduce the command line tax to get people to use advanced tools for wikis. Um, so starting up to Forge, which is the easiest of all those alternatives, um, means you have to set up, uh, it, it's possible for experienced programmers, but it means you have to set up a developer account for Wikitech. Uh, you need to set up an SSH key. You need to upload that to Striker. Um, you have to learn what is the job grid and Kubernetes, or Kubernetes, I mean, one of those is fine. Um, and for Cloud VPS, you have to do second factor authentication. And there are, there are still weird edge cases, uh, though they've been improved a lot the last few years by the Cloud team. Uh, for POS, you just go to the web page, you sign in with your Wikimedia account, and that's it. You can start a notebook, you can start to code immediately. And everything that you do there is already open access, and you won't can access it under the public pause page. Um, one thing uh, that kind of shows this is that pause has now 3,487 users that have ever used pause, while 2Forge had 2,150. I mean, obviously, 2Forge users, the medium, the average 2Forge user is more active on 2Forge than the, the pause user is active on pause. But this means that more people have at least some contact with advanced uh, editing capabilities. And you can see the growth is a lot higher for Paul's. The, the last time I did a talk like this was in 2019, and we've had 1,200 something uh, new Paul's users and only about a little bit less than 400 new 2Forge users. How does Paul's work? This is a bit advanced, but I just want to get this out of the way. POS is a uh, Kubernetes-backed Jupyter Hub instance. So every time that a user gets into POS, well, 
a pod is created, a server is created for them inside of K Kubernetes POS cluster. And storage there is handled by NFS. And authentication, not only to get in and define who you are, but also to get uh, access to the API is done with MediaWiki at Meta. This is the general technical, uh, one of the general technical diagrams for that. Users get into the proxy, the proxy sends us to the hub with authentication, and then you have a user pod separated for each user there. Um, I can go to more detail if anyone wants, but this is not the main focus of this. So what can pause do? Um, a lot of use cases are endless because it's a server and you can do anything you want with it. Um, but uh, use cases are usually quick data exploration. This is something that I do myself a lot. Um, even for before writing tools, I'll go into pause and I'll write something to understand what's actually possible. And that means that I don't have to get into ToolForge and try to query databases or to uh, use PyWikiBot in ToolForge. I can just do that a lot easier in, in the web uh, interface with POS. Uh, creating dashboards, this is a very cool uh, use case for POS because um, the, the dashboards can be updated and you just create a notebook and instead of having something that you copy and run on ToolForge every time, you, you have a web page with the results. And, and it's a lot easier to share and, and show that to other people. And mo making bot edits on a wiki, that's a very common use case. You can do that both from the terminal and from the notebook. Uh, the current limitations for pause is that we don't yet have a way to schedule execution. So it's just something that you're running while the, while the browser is open. After an hour, the, the server that is open there will be killed. So you can get away from your computer and the browser is there, that's fine, it will still run. But if you shut down the internet or your browser, uh, after one hour, that will be killed and it won't run anymore. Using POS is easy. This is a 30-second demonstration of that. I just input the page there, sign in with MediaWiki. It already gets my username. And I allow it, and I'm in my server. And I can create a Python notebook from there, or I can create a terminal. And that's that's it. I mean, the, the 30 seconds there. Forking in pause is almost easy. Hopefully, we can get something a little bit better on this hackathon. But as I said, and as can hopefully be seen over here at the end of the video, once once we create a notebook, we immediately get this public link over here. So this is just a link to the POS public uh, instance with this notebook. Even this empty notebook will be there. Um, and forking means that you can actually go to this public link for other users and then download the notebook and upload it into your own POS server. So this is the workflow for that. You go into the public link. Um, you add format equal raw at the end of your URL. And then you can save that. And I have the almost here exactly because it's not as easy as we wanted to make. So um, choosing one notebook here, um, my first notebook. And I can kind of show that just adding the format raw. And you can save. Yeah, Windows messes with the extension, so you need to save as all files there. And then we have notebook locally, and I can upload that to my POS server. Using POS is very easy. I mean, we have notebooks. And the, the three things that I, I like to teach people about notebooks 
is that we're using cells. The notebooks itself is not the, the, the context of what you're executing. You're executing each cell. Uh, each cell can be code or it can be marked down. And cells can be run in any order. This is a print screen from that, my first notebook. Um, and it shows that this cell was run, uh, the seventh thing that was run. And the first one of import was run as the 18th thing that was run. And this usually happens because you're changing something on the top cell and then you run it again. Um, and then you go down to another cell and run it. So it's a very interactive way of running code. Uh, but in the end, the order does matter in terms of presentation. So you can also have these markdown cells, like a first glimpse into power pause is a markdown cell. And let me show you that live on my first notebook over here. So this is something that I forked, and you saw the video of me forking this a few minutes ago. Um, and as you can see, this is a markdown cell, and I can double click it to have it as the raw markdown. And I could, for example, make this a level two heading instead of a level one. And it will, as soon as I run it, um, now be a level two heading instead of a level one. And the same, if I run this, this is from the forked instance. I have never run any of these cells. So if I run it again, it will now be uh, level one. And if I can continue down, it will be level two, level three, level four. Um, that, let me show you this other, um, this other notebook that has more interesting examples of how you can use Python notebooks to do things in, in wikis. Now, this notebook is very comprehensive. It has getting started with APIs and all kinds of ways to interact with the different media wiki APIs, um, and even with outside APIs, apparently. But it's interesting like how you could use requests, which is a popular uh, Python library, and the page that you want. And here's a, an interesting way to interact with it. And this, since it's not even authenticated, should work out of the box to get it. And we can get the response from the REST API here. Um, PyWikiBot is very interesting because we already insert, um, we already insert authentication for it. So this is not an authenticated request because we're just uh, getting the text. We're not saving. But we could uh, then say page and I won't do it, uh, page.text equals something else. And if I then go page.save, it will actually, and I run this, it will actually make the edit for me as, Paul, as my user that has logged in. And I'm not going to run this because vandalism is not nice. But as you can see, it's a very interesting way. And it's the most common way that I use uh, pause and PyWikiPod. Um, this notebook is very interesting. It has lots of, um, lots of instructions in Markdown. And it's a very good practice to have to not only have your notebooks, but also have documentation inside the notebooks. And let me go back to that table of contents. It also has the, the, the same instruction on how to fork a notebook. And uh, these are not working, these, these links inside, but they do work on the public, uh, on the public option. And you can also use outside APIs because this is, again, uh, open service, open server that you can use anything on it. You can run anything. Um, one thing that I want to stress also is that most of the uses of pause are Python notebooks, but these don't have to be Python notebooks. I could have here, this is running as a Python 3 kernel, and what we already have installed in, in pause is Python and R and bash kernels. And soon we'll install Julia kernel because that was asked for. 
But we could have several things over here. We could have Node. We could have, uh, I mean, the possibilities really are vast. Um, so if anyone wants a new kernel running for POS, please ask. And we can take a look at how that's possible. Um, where can we take POS? Uh, Jupyter Hub is a project that is being developed very quickly. And the, the whole Jupyter Notebook also develops quickly and has lots of releases and new features. So we can incorporate that into POS. One of the, one, one, one of the interesting ones that already is there is Jupyter Lab. And if we, uh, that's not what I wanted, I'm sorry. We have 10 minutes left, Chico, just letting you know. Thank you. That was a perfect um, moment to say that. <laughs> um, so we're here on the, the traditional um, interface. But if we change over here, we have a secret interface that's called Jupyter Lab. And it should be a little bit nicer. And this will be fixed soon. But it has very different interface and more modern, I think. And this is what's actually currently maintained by uh, the Jupyter Lab team a lot more than the Jupyter interface. One of the reasons that we don't have this as default yet is that if we open it here, the same notebook, as you can see, it's already running because I was running it over there. We don't have the same uh, public link. Uh, that's one of the extensions that we need to figure out how to do for Jupyter Lab. But it's a very interesting interface for, for people to use. And the public link can be figured out just by changing this to public or changing the link over here. We can copy shareable link. And this, if we just go public, it should, uh, yeah, it did not. So it's... Yeah, there's some URL hacking there to get it. That's the main reason that we haven't switched yet, but it's a nicer interface overall. Um, so as I mentioned, adding new languages to be used is very, uh, possibilities are very vast. We probably, at Julia, hopefully by the end of the hackathon. And the, I mean, it's just a very long list of possible kernels over here. Um, we're not adding them because maintaining this is not free, uh, not free of effort. So whenever we have a request, we'll probably add it. Um, we also need some extensions that could be used to solve these issues. I mean, allow scheduling of execution has been a dream of mine for a few years. Um, drafts and publishing would be nice as well to have. Um, Jupyter Notebooks have, by default, a, a versioning system that is being marked as checkpoints. And we have the, all the versions of the previous versions of the notebook also stored. But a way of um, presenting that to all the users would be very nice. So kind of like have drafts and publishing so that the public could have a more uh, polished view of the notebooks and have some kind of source control like Git would be very nice as well because right now it's kind of hard to even for advanced users to understand what's going on on the versions of their notebooks. Um, are were there any questions for for me? This is the end. Not yet. I don't see any questions, but people are free to free. Just feel free to ask any in the YouTube chat. I also have the YouTube chat open, so I can respond to anything. And well, So um, I'll be available, uh, as I said in the beginning, for all 
anyone that wants to hasn't tested pause yet and want to use it uh, I mean I'm not the only one who knows how to use it so you can ask other people in telegram IRC or we work adventure and there's lots of people that can help um, and I'm available as well I can do a session to help with your particular notebook or script um, Susana is asking if there are any challenges with uploading images for example. Um, I've done a few image uploads from Pulse, but the bigger challenge that you have is to use this interface to get images here. So what I usually use to upload images to comments when I'm doing Pulse, I don't know if I have any. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure that I'll have one here. But what I use is something that I'm getting images from some other source, because sending images to pause is not easy in this interface. So getting images from, like scraping a website into pause and then sending it to, uh, to I think I have some here. Uh, no, this was just Excel, um, XML. And sending it directly to commas is something that I've done in the past. But doing it directly with um, images on your notebook is not as easy. It wouldn't be my tool, my tool of choice. Any other questions? There's only three minutes left, I think. Let's wait a minute, and then we can wrap up. Yes, I think so. No, no other questions. We do have one question, or two. First is, can you import ice in module you wrote in the system? Um, yes, yes, you can. It's actually, let me share my screen again for this. Um, UV actually made some magic that we can re uh, import things that other users wrote in the file system. Mm -hmm. And you can definitely import things that you yourself wrote. So I, it's not, I mean, this is just a Python. So there's a Python kernel running in the back. So you can really port anything that you have over here. I don't normally use this, so I don't quite remember the syntax that UV created for this. But I, I can look it up and, and send people. Send looking. What's the? It's more of a call out, right? The Susanna's mentioning that we're meeting the math rooms in Work Adventure after this workshop for Jupyter Notebooks, and uh, I'll be there as well. Uh, I'm not sure how useful I'll be because there will be plenty of people to help. But let's go over there as well. Awesome. So I think we are time and we can wrap up. Thank you so much, Chico. And Thank you. See you the next talk.